This is one of, if not the most badass figure in Canadian history. Matanabe was a Dene man who spent his life roaming northern Canada. He was what we call the principal man, a simultaneously respected and feared figure among indigenous nations and HBC employees alike. He brought peace between warring nations, took part in one of the greatest expeditions in Canadian history, only to see his life end in dramatic fashion. Matanabe was born in 1736, at a time when the fur trade was expanding into northern Canada. He grew up at Prince of Wales Fort, where is Churchill, Manitoba today, where his father was a hunter who provided meat to the Hudson's Bay Company workers during the winter time. Before he was even a year old, Matanabe's father passed away, which left him to be raised by the governor of the fort at the time, Richard Norton, along with his Cree wife. For the first five years of his life, Matanabe would grow up in an environment where he was speaking Cree with his stepmother, English with Norton, and interacting with different indigenous nations who were coming at the fort to trade with the English. He became immersed in a multi-ethnic environment where he was not only learning different languages, but getting to observe the different cultures of all these different nations that were coming at the fort. By 1741, Richard Norton and his Cree wife had both died, which left Matanabe orphaned at only five years old. As a result, he would get taken in by some Dene relatives of his father. The Dene lived a migratory life where they would follow herds like caribou, the winters would be spent more sheltered around streams for fishing, and the summers trekking the barren grounds. For the next 17 years of his life, Matanabe would be among his Dene people, going all over northern Canada and living off the land. When he was 22 years old, he decided to return to Prince of Wales Fort to act as a hunter just like his father had in the past. The Hudson's Bay Company came to really value Matanabe. He had learned English with Richard Norton, spoke Cree because of his stepmom, and also knew Dene. He was culturally aware, knowing the different customs of the Cree, the Dene, the English. He was able to build bridges between people, facilitate business relationships, and even bring peace. The HBC would use them as an ambassador of some sort of representative, we could also call it for the Hudson's Bay Company. He would be sent to the lands of the Athapusco, which were a Cree nation located around Great Slave Lake, to bring peace between them and the Dene. He would also end conflicts between competing Dene nations like the Yellow Knives and the Tlichos, while all at the same time building these business relationships for him and the Hudson's Bay Company. Throughout that time, he built his own prestige. He served as a middleman to different Cree and Dene nations that were far away from the Hudson's Bay, earning a reputation as a man who could bring wealth to all these distant people and commended respect and admirations from many nations across the North. He was traveling extensively and often under great hardship, always under the threat of starvation. During one of his many trips coming back from the north, he brought back copper deposits, which would spur one of the greatest adventures in Canadian history. The Hudson's Bay Company had enlisted a man called Samuel Hearn, along with some autonomy, for an expedition to the Copper Mine River. Samuel Hearn, he had previously tried twice to go up north, but simply didn't have the knowledge to survive in the barren grounds, nor did he have the required relationships or the proper etiquette with indigenous people that could help him navigate this completely foreign environment. Now he had Matanabe, an expert and a renowned figure across the north. On December 7th, 1770, they would depart on one of the greatest adventures in Canadian history. During their journey, Matanabe was the undisputed leader, while Hearn documented all of the events over land that no European had ever seen before. Hearn's safety was guaranteed by what we call the principal man, and that man was Matanabe. A principal man was somebody who was simultaneously feared and respected. Matanabe got respect from other nations by practicing what we called ritualized generosity. He'd be giving gifts to nations he'd meet for the first time, not only to establish a good base for a business relationship, but also showing them that he was a man who was wealthy, who had connections, and could really bring them a better life. Matanabe also had a whole entourage that was supporting him, whether it was servants, cooks, he had multiple wives, and even nine children. In his journals, Hearn documented how imposing and impressive Matanabe was. In stature, Matanabe was above the common size, being nearly six feet high. His features were regular and agreeable, and yet so strongly marked and expressive. He was one of the 
the finest and best proportioned men I ever saw. There was also a dark side to Mitanabe. Like many other Dene, Mitanabe held deep animosity towards nations with whom the Dene and the Kree had previously had conflicts with. One of these nations were the Inuit. During the expedition, one of the bloodiest events in Canadian history occurred, the Bloody Falls Massacre. By May of 1771, Hearn and Mitanabe would encounter other Dene groups like the Yellow Knives, the Tlitchos, and some Cree. Hearn noticed that the group was getting smaller and smaller and that the men were leaving their wives and their children behind. He saw each man also making themselves wooden shields that were painted with figures like the sun, the moon, and animals. The men had also painted their faces with red and black stripes. Mitanabe had assembled a war party of 200 people to attack their common enemy, the Inuit. It was on a clear night on July 5th, 1771, where the Bloody Falls massacre would occur, Matanabe and his 200 men would attack and slaughter an Inuit camp of 50 people. It's important to note that during that time, the Inuit didn't have any of these modern weapons like guns to defend themselves. The reason for that is simply because they weren't trading with the English during that time. Pre-existing conflicts already existed between them, the Dene, the Cree, and trade with the English amplified these tensions. Obviously, products like guns gave them a gigantic advantage when it came to warfare and gave them more incentive to keep going at war against nations that didn't have them to defend themselves. It was two weeks after that event, on July 18, 1771, that the two would finally reach the Copper Mine River. To Hearn's disappointment, they weren't able to find any significant copper deposits, but despite that setback, the journey couldn't be considered a failure. Hearn had been able to map out a significant portion of northern Canada that no other European had ever been to before. He had encountered different indigenous nations and therefore had opened up new markets for the Hudson's Bay Company. Their way back to Prince of Wales would take another full year, with Samuel Hearn and Mitanabe crossing Great Slave Lake, making Hearn the first European to see that lake. By the end of it, Hearn and Mitanabe, they had trekked more than 8,000 kilometers in total all over Canada's Arctic. Hearn not only was the first European to see Great Slave Lake, but he was also the first one to see the Arctic Ocean, bringing him this enormous knowledge of the people and the land that no European had ever experienced before. After 1776, there's different factors that came into play that were not only completely changing the dynamics of the fur trade in northern Canada, but also came to significantly alter Matanabe's life. First was the emergence of the Montreal-based Northwest Company. The Northwest Company established inland trading forts that were in direct competition with the Hudson's Bay Company. These inland forts were meant to cut off the middlemen of the fur trade, people just like Matanabe, so that they could trade directly with indigenous nations instead. Second was the American Revolution. The American Revolution was supported by France, which was a former colonial power in Canada, which has been recently defeated by the English. In order to support the Americans, the French would disrupt trade in the Hutz Bay Company, which was one of the biggest economic engines of the colony. French ships eventually made their way to Prince of Wales, where they would completely destroy it. The fort was not only where Matanabe had grown up, but where much of his business was being done with the English. It had now been completely extinguished, along with all the other resources whether they were food or different products that other nations had come to depend on. Lastly, there's the massive effects of smallpox. During the end of the 1770s and over the course of the 1780s, a massive smallpox epidemic completely ravaged Rupert's land. According to the journals that Samuel Hearn kept, around 80 to 90 percent of the Dene population had died because of smallpox. Matanabe had undoubtedly lost friends, family, and business partners during that time. So all these three factors together make it so that Matanabe had lost almost everything that brought meaning to his life. His role as a middleman was completely eliminated by the Northwest Company, which meant that his status among indigenous nations had been lost. His childhood home and place where he did business was destroyed by the French, and smallpox had made him lose friends, his family, and the rest of his nation. He lost everything that made him who he was, his livelihood, his authority, and ultimately his identity. His fall would come in 1782, when he decided to end his own life. When we reflect on Matanabe today, he's not a very well-known figure in my opinion in, in, in Canada and in Canadian culture. I think you ask the majority of people, they won't necessarily know who Matanabe is unless they may live in, in Churchill, Manitoba, or you're part of the Dene Nation. However, he is a person of national historic significance in Canada, and there is a monument that's dedicated to him in Churchill, Manitoba, and he's someone that we should be speaking of at a deeper level when we teach 
Canadian culture and in education in, in general in Canada. In my opinion, we need to talk about it and it needs to be taught because he's a badass, first of all. By knowing his story, we'll get to learn a lot more about how Canada was before we were officially Canada. How was it in Rupert's land? What were the dynamics between the Dene, the Cree, the Inuit, the English? Get to know figures that left a lasting legacy in our country. He lived life trekking a very harsh environment. He was multilingual, speaking Cree, speaking Dene, English. There's a lot that we can base Canadian identity on, on who Matanabe was as a person, and his story's worth being told, and we need to talk about it more.